Attention crewmates, Hero's ship or a minimum of one planet must explode in first act. But what does that mean? Prepare the Plutonian Octopus, Darius! Initiate self-destruct sequence. Hello, I'm Carl King and welcome to this making of documentary thing for my album, Grand Architects of the Universe. The goal for this album was to write a 45-minute continuous, or seemingly continuous, piece of instrumental music, which I titled Hero's Ship, or Minimum of One Planet, Must Explode in First Act. On previous Sir Millard Mulch or Dr. Zoltan albums, I always felt my weakness was my lack of ability to sustain an idea for more than a minute or so. I would often write a verse, a chorus, and then copy and paste repeat those a few times and just end on the tonic chord and move on to the next song as soon as I could. The process of theme and variation had for some reason eluded me for 20 years of writing music. Another major learning curve during the recording of this album was going back to school. I began studying film scoring and composition through Berkeley College of Music. I ended up orchestrating a long form nine minute piece about Conan the Barbarian and hired a string trio and bassoonerist to play on the record. Getting back into music notation and even sight reading has been part of this process, and I'm slowly filling in gaps in my musical education. Since I had not made an album in almost 10 years, I decided to start out with what I considered to be straightforward music. A lot of it is in 4-4, 3-4, and 6-8, with the occasional odd meter drum solo explosion. Compared to my last album, the Dr. Zoltan failure, it's really easy stuff. I took a handful of uh, simple melodies and rhythms, these core concepts or groups of notes, and mixed them up for 45 minutes. And we'll see if I can make the next album more adventurous rhythmically now that I almost know what I'm doing. I started composing this album on July 7th, 2015, and released it on May 15th, 2017. That's almost a two-year process. In this documentary thing, I'm going to walk you through the steps I took to make this thing. Everything from humming a melody and strumming an idea on my acoustic guitar, to MIDI piano sketches, tracking drums, all the way through to mixing. So let's start at the beginning and see how this all happened. I often write my melodies by strumming some chords on an acoustic guitar and humming. This has been my process for most of everything I've done, although I also compose directly in MIDI to Cubase. When I'm writing on guitar and humming, I'll sometimes shoot a quick webcam video of myself so I can come back later and remember what the hell I did. I'm about to show you some really bad, candid clips of me struggling to find the right notes in my home studio and what the finished product sounded like on the album. Before I do that, I have one special audio clip I want to play. This was the first audio recording I made on July 15th, 2015, of what I consider the main grand architect's melody, and probably played on my old Charvel guitar. And as promised, here are some of the webcam videos as I wrote the melodies. That I have the secret.
is the dorsal Tycho generator. This is the piano roll. On one side of the screen, you have these piano keys. Um, this over here is the horizontal where it plays across. And these are the velocities of each note. And uh, it's basically an imitation of one of those old player pianos that uh, the sheet music feeds through with all the little holes and triggers the notes. Anyway, this is the way that I compose all of my music, including this album. I wrote the whole thing in this piano roll, and uh, it sounds like this. Now this is track number two, uh, which came to be known as the unexpected tecronicity of the network galaxy's most evil of all. And this is the first track I wrote a couple of years ago that I called The Overture, but it came to be known that other long, complicated name. So what I generally do, you can, you can see it right here really clearly in this section. Let me play this. Now here you can see very clearly that there are three different voices happening. There's the main melody right here, up on top. Then there's the middle voice, which is the sort of counter melody or harmony, but it's a counterpoint. It's not playing the exact notes as above. It's filling in the gaps, and you can see that there are gaps here. See these dark purple ones are much lower dynamics so you can see this one plays a long note while this one is playing several short notes and then there is the bass voice so this is basically a three-part counterpoint and it's basically how I do everything it's how I did the entire album if you go to any section, you can generally find three voices happening. Bass, which ends up being, in a rock context, when I have the rock band part playing, this would be bass and guitar. Uh, and usually the drums would also be sort of following this rhythm, playing against it. And then a middle voice here, which can sometimes end up being some chords banged out, like right here. But then there's the upper voice again. And that's pretty much the formula for how I composed the entire album. Three voices. You can very clearly see them. One, two, three. This one's going up. This one's kind of going down. You can skip to pretty much anywhere and find that basic arrangement happening. See, these are some chords. And up here we got... Actually, we got four voices happening at once, although these chords are just basically filling in as a pad. There's still this up here, top voice, middle voice. Sometimes they almost overlap or get very close, but I try to keep them separate. And people who are really good at counterpoint can write even more complex stuff than this. This is actually pretty basic, I think. So here we have just a little rhythmic thing on the top, which is just filling in. It's not doing much of anything important. The important part is here, main melody, counter melody, bass voice. Who knows, maybe someday I'll actually get into writing more complex four-part four part counterpoint. See, these chords are not really, they don't count as a voice. 
so much. It's not an independent thing. These are just block chords banging out, but you do have this, these independent lines all doing different things. So what I would basically do is I take my chord and my melody that I wrote on guitar, and these would have been those chords that I had written on the guitar, and this uh, this one is actually the main melody in this case, and this one is a more quiet counterpoint happening whenever there's a long note here tend to have short notes up here. Long note here, bunch of short notes here. And see this? Long notes up here, staccato notes here. So when the melody and the counter melody are busy, the chords are simpler. So that's a way of creating contrast. You don't want to have too many voices all playing the same rhythm. You want them to all be on different parts of the chord at the same time, all in their own little space. You don't want a bunch of doubling. This is all like uh, music theory uh, composition stuff that I learned in college in writing four-part choir music, which I still try to adhere to generally. I try to you know follow these good voice leading moves and everything. And as you can see, if I close out of this, I have the entire album basically written, all 10, well, not the entire album, but the large piece of music called Hero's Ship or Minimum of One Planet Must Explode in First Act. Uh, you can see that's all here, 10 pieces. You can open up any one of these, piano, see what's going on. Uh, so I basically, once I have that entire thing written, I have the basic compositional sketch of the entire album. I start going in and saying, well, first of all, is this going to be a rock section or is it going to be an orchestral section? You have to decide that first. And then if I say this is a rock section right here, then these bottom notes will go to guitar and bass. These would go to some sort of counter melody, maybe a harmony rhythm guitar, harmony lead guitar, and then the lead guitar up here. And maybe keyboards in between, you wanna create some contrast. You want a little bit of a, a breather there. I actually had a little pen tuplet there. Pen tuplet, five notes. One, two, three, four, five. And I believe Travis Orban did a, he matched that little rhythm there. If you listen to the original track, looks like at 7.08.06, if you go and find, you might find it there. And so that is how I compose part two. When I first started working on this record, my naive goal was to blend a rock band and an orchestra. And as hard as I tried, it just didn't sound good. I ended up waffling back and forth several times, deciding I'd just make a completely orchestral album, then a rock record, then a fully orchestral album, because those two worlds can never truly blend. Here's a really early demo in which I decided to take the album in an entirely orchestral direction. It's funny to hear at this point.
My two main guitars on this album were a Schecter 7-string FRS and a PRS SE Custom 24. I used the Schecter for the majority of the metal rhythm and lead tones. The best part of it is the Sustainiac pickup, which allows me to hold a note indefinitely while it morphs into various feedback-like harmonics. Combining that with a whammy pedal and whammy bar creates this over-the-top metal lead guitar screaming that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. I'd often play leads in three-part harmonies, and at the end, sustain a note into the next part of the song, letting it slowly fade out over several measures. After using a Sustainiac, I just don't want to play electric guitar without one. The other main guitar is my PRS SE Custom 24. It's a remarkably affordable guitar for the quality. I bought this guitar to use on the album because it has a coil tap, allowing me to get single coil Strat-like clean tones. I also used it for some thinner rock and roll tones here and there. The third guitar I used is my Yamaha APX500 Roman numeral 3 acoustic. It's got a small body and it's lightweight, so it's perfect for grabbing it from the stand and quickly writing some parts. It's become my favorite guitar to play. I record it directly into the interface, no miking. That direct acoustic sound is pretty cool, I think. Coincidentally, I did get out my old Sir Millard Malt Charvel that I bought for $100 at Troll Music in 1996 or so. I installed a MIDI pickup and I ran it through the Roland synth to get sitar sounds, among other things. Since 1999, I've been playing this Ibanez Soundgear six-string bass. I love the feel of it, but the tone always bugged me. When making this album, I decided I had to have a Rickenbacker for the main bass parts. This Rickenbacker is a Walnut 4003, and I use the stereo Ricco sound jack to split the signal into two different amp simulators. I use good old Amplitube and ran one pickup into a Mesa Boogie rectifier and the other into some Ampeg bass amp. I have to say this is my dream bass guitar and it only has one drawback. It does not have a low B string. Now I considered filing the nut to be able to fit a low B on it, but I decided to preserve the bass as is. As a result, there are several parts on the album where the low B on my seven string guitar is actually in unison with the bass instead of them being an octave apart. It would have added another level of heaviness if I had added a low B, but oh well. Don't worry, maybe there'll be a work for you. Marco Miniman was the first drummer that recorded tracks for this album. He was just leaving to tour the world with Joe Satriani, but he fit this into his schedule one evening. As always, I was shocked at how fast he recorded his tracks. It seemed like it took him less than an hour to do everything and send me the files from his home studio. Let's take a look at some of these Marco Miniman drums on track two of the album. He plays a drum solo at the end or towards the end after this guitar solo section and it sounds like this by itself. And for that section, I went back to the tune track drums. It's one of the few spots on the album that there actually are some tune track drums happening. And then it comes back in at the end. It's a pretty crazy uh, double kick there at the end. If I solo these, I don't know what rhythm he's doing there, but it's pretty interesting. Mm. 
You'd have to ask the composer, Mr. Carl King, what the hell he was doing there. I don't know. I don't even remember if I wrote that into the uh, temp drum track. I don't think I did. I think he came up with that. He actually recorded these drums very quickly and sent them to me. Like I asked him if he could do it and I sent him the files and then he would, he said he would try to do them this weekend. And then like an hour later, he sends me a message. All done. Uploading now. Crazy person. Now regarding the mix, you can see here, uh, let's bring it over here a little to the left, get that centered. These are the drum tracks in yellow going across here in Marco's group of tracks. I've got a trigger on the kick. And on the snare, there's also some trigger happening. On the main hits, you can see on those main hard hits, a snare, a, a snare trigger kicks in. But it's also blended with his real drums in a lot of cases, so that those original signals are coming through. It's just that the heavier hits are enhanced, which was a little bit more organic of a way to do it, especially when someone is playing with so many levels of dynamics all over the kit. Uh, so I gated some things, added some triggers on the toms. I'm also using these Chris Lord Algae presets, which I tweaked a bit. Uh, and then the basic overheads, which with also some CLAs on them. And that's basically it. There was some EQing happening that was pretty drastic on the toms so that I could bring out the attack at the top and then take out a little bit of the a little notch there to get rid of some ring or some uh, sort of frequencies to clean it up a little bit. And that's basically it for the mixing part. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, you can zoom out here and see, there's another section that Marco played towards the end of the album. Let's see what that is. Uh, it's a pretty fun section. It's Mike Keneally. It gets a little crazier. You can see there, you see how dynamic he is, even with the kicks. It's like a broom on the kicks. It's not just, you know, he's not a one dynamic kind of guy. You see all of these ups and downs. That right there is my favorite Marco moment on the record. One of my favorite drum moments on the entire record of anything. Check this out. He's playing a quintuplet or five tuplet or pentuplet, whichever you'd like to call it. One, two, three, four, five. With a flam on the kick drum. A flam with a pentuplet. I think that's super creative. And uh, he probably just does this, you know, it's easy for him. 
Probably did this all in one pass. That's kind of funny. At the end there, he does another little. -da 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 -da. Little accent on the last note. It's a good way to go about doing that. It's much better than just robotic playing. Now, I also have these other parts that way out here that I haven't listened to in a long time, but he did a bunch of uh, crazy extra solos that I might. I don't know what I'll ever do with these. Just unmute these here so we can hear them real quick. I'll uh, hop around to a couple of points in this. I don't even know what we're going to hear. Another one here. It's very expressive with the kick drums there. Put it up, put it up, put it up. It's a nice sort of little detail you get when you get. Marco Miniman drum tracks. Get to look at them. Pretty neat. Basically, I asked him to give me some freeform solos that were in five or related to the number five. So he did some 5.8 and 5.16 stuff or something like that. Uh, I haven't even gotten into all the detail of them and done anything with them yet because they weren't part of the songs. Oh boy. What? Well, that's really something. And all of these line up to a click. He gave me a tempo on each one. Uh, I just don't know what I'm ever going to do with those. So there they will sit in my project at the end of it. Maybe I'll release them on uh, Patreon, something like that. Thomas Lang became a friend of mine when I started filming his Big Drum Bonanza every year. When I first met him, I was very intimidated by him. He's this huge muscular dude with a serious face, but I quickly learned he's a total goofball. He's a warm and easygoing guy and surprisingly playful. When filming him at the Big Drum Bonanza, I would get him to do wacky stuff like play drums in the pool. It hopefully goes without saying that he is a very advanced drummer, especially in the world of four-way independence, and his ability to learn and play anything. Thomas was nice enough to record not only himself playing on my record, but also Dave Elich. Here are some clips of Thomas playing his improvised solos. one. That was a close one. That was a close one. Now that we have met the extra head, can you, t can you whisper it like Kiefer Sutherland?
Dave Elich's playing really made an impact on me when I was filming him up close at Big Drum Bonanza back in 2013 or so. My immediate thought was, I need to make a new album and have this guy on it. Luckily, he was willing to take a break from Hot Sauce to Oblige. During the process of planning this record, I met with Dave at his studio early on, played him some crappy demos, and we ran through some ideas. Here's a short clip from our initial meeting where he's demonstrating some rhythms for me. Later on, Dave came over to Thomas Lang's place, and we recorded him doing several drum solos. It was fun to get Dave to do this sort of stuff on a record because he's mostly known for very aggressive metal bashing or pop gigs, but he's clearly an extremely versatile player that can adapt to anything. Here are the full clips of him going for it. This galaxy has really gone down here. tubes and prepare to fire. the bulk of the main drum tracks on this album, I decided to hire Travis Orban. Travis has a studio in rural Delaware where he meticulously charts and reads millions of drum sessions for bands. I remember being amused and impressed by his rendition of Pig by Steve Vai on YouTube, in which he seemed to be reading the whole time. 
There are so many tempo ramps and dynamic shifts on Grand Architects that I thought Travis would be the ideal choice for knocking out all these parts. It took him two nights to track the whole album, reading it from charts. He notates everything in Guitar Pro, of all things, and this is what they look like. Who Flush is a perfectly good Bossendorfer out the airlock. All he wanted me to send him was MP3s, and he did everything else. I didn't need to hire an engineer or rent a studio or even chart anything out myself. It was nuts. He just delivered the finished product, and I dropped them into Cubase. Zero problems. It was the most efficient recording experience I've had. At the end of this documentary, I'm including all of Travis's videos from the tracking sessions for the entire album. What a thing. Let's take a look at what Morgan Ogren did on this album. Here's his drum tracks right here in this folder. Can pop them open here. Gonna have to zoom in. Oh boy. A little too far. I want to zoom in that far. Okay. Here are his tracks. Let's solo his drums here and see what he did. This would have been on track number six, which ended up being called Attacked by Legion of Ikek, Ship Destroyed Again. So let's hear what that sounds like. Pretty dry, clean tone, although on the snare, let's bring that up over here. Where are we at? We're on Morgan's drums are over here to the right. A little bit of triggering happening on the kick and snare, just to bring out. bring out those hits, although I think they're also blended with the original. It's quite a dry tone. Let's bring Keneally back in here so you... This is a documentary. There's not a whole lot going on. Actually, looks like on the kick and snare, I used some basic plugins and then no plugins on the rest of the channels, just some EQ, a little boost, a little cut. Um, usually I would, you know, boost, bring out some attack and then get rid of a little bit of the just cut a little bit of the tones that are too chubby sounding, too boxy. And hi-hat, I brought out some crispness, brought down the lows, and then low cut on the overheads, and that was it. And you can see there's really nothing, nothing magical happening here, aside from his playing, obviously. Let's see what we got. So 
it was nice having Morgan back again and getting these rather clean drums from him. So dry. Uh, really a big fan of the dry sounds. So I always really prefer to get the original signals and mess with them myself. A lot of drummers really like to try to send you their mix. And that can be really hard to fit someone else's mix into your own mix. So uh, I always fight to get the original raw tracks so that I can blend everything myself. There's no way I can do something with with trying to blend someone else's idea of the, what the drum should sound like, especially when you have five or six different drummers on the same album. You need to have them similar enough with their own own different personality, but you still want everything to sound cohesive enough so that it doesn't sound like it's recorded in completely different worlds because that would just sound like you made a mistake or didn't know what you were doing. Mike Keneally. I've never met a musician who has such an immediate connection with his instrument. He thinks music and it happens. There was only one section of the album he quickly notated out the chord changes to because I was wanting something pretty strictly adhering to those chords. Okay, you wanna jot it down? Yeah. Played it to him, and then he wrote it down. How does he do that? <laughs> oh, how I did that? I can't do that. All right, you ready? Yep. Yeah. Plastic polka scene. Now here is a cool moment from the album where Keneally plays a guitar solo over a Dave Elitch drum solo.
have escaped with our lives, so we may squander them again another day. Exactly the kind of little touch that this stuff needs, like a real organic player that Sweet. can do this sort of thing. Yeah. I met Dweezil because of the Frank Zappa business lesson cartoon I animated back in 2011. He ended up hiring me to do a bunch of video work for him over the next five years. While he was in the studio recording his solo album, Be a Zamata, he brought in this incredible fretless Gibson SG with a Sustainiac pickup, and I thought it was the coolest guitar tone. It was like Steve Vai's Flexible, but even crazier. You can hear him doing a beautiful solo on his own song, Truth. Anyway, it wasn't until I was recording this album that I told him about my music and asked him to play a guitar solo on that guitar for me, which he did. Let's take a look here in Cubase and see what Dweezil did throughout this mess. Now, I used little bits of Dweezil's fretless guitar. Uh, out here at the end, you'll see I, have, I just rolled Cubase, and we just recorded a bunch of uh, stereo fractal stuff of him just improvising and in uh in C Lydian or something like that I don't recall uh and he just played a bunch of licks and so I just used that throughout the main piece dropped them in here and there so here's one of those little bits Here he uses really, really heavy, thick picks that are made out of, I don't know, stone or something. So check out this pick attack sound. So it makes this chirping sort of sound. Let's hear what part of the album that's on just for context. Of course I could have let that asteroid obliterate the planet in a firestorm. Commander, there appears. Of course, I could have left. There appears to be a time slug in our path. Damn these chronometric gastropods. That was Keneally saying that, but we'll get to that later. Uh, let's hear another one of these little samples that Dweezel did. And here's what it sounded like in the whole mix. which is not all that audible for the most part, but it's in there if you listen closely. Here's another little section. Ha, instant 2000. <laughs> I think that's a really cool tone that he gets there on that fretless. I really want one. Really need to get a fretless guitar. Here's another little sample that he did. Pretty cool. And then looks like there's a bunch of little dweezel bits here. Let's see what he's doing here. What is this? That is actually during the cello solo. And that is on, let's see where we're at. Where are the markers? I can't say. Track nine, 
We got Artyom doing a cello solo, and we got Dweezil doing these little bits in the background. I think that's backwards one. Maybe. It's one of his famous do 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 playing his fives. And over here, we've got what's left over. A whole bunch of dweezilisms. Just sustained notes. Here we have the actual tone that he set up on my fractal, which I still have saved and maybe I'll offer it somewhere. He has one drive uh, a fuzz. It's basically got two signals coming through here. One of them has a fuzz and two different amps and cabinets, a Comet Concourse and a Brit JM45. I think that's a Marshall. So on one side, he's got the Marshall with the fuzz and a 4x12. And pan hard left, looks like. And then the other amp, the Comet Concourse, and 4x12 basket weave. Is that the same cabinet? F O 4 O. No, it looks like they're two different cabinets, too. And then over here, he's got a multi CP, which I don't know what that is. Multi-compressor? I don't know what that's doing. That's on a third chain here. I just quickly plugged in my PRS here. You can hear this is a very dry and uh, fuzzy tone. I'm not sure if this is recording in stereo or not, but these are panned hard left and right, so hopefully you can hear that in there. Interesting stuff. Maybe I will actually make this uh, fractal setting available to my Kickstarter supporters. Seems like something I could throw in pretty easily that would uh, be easy for me to do, and maybe some of you out there would uh, enjoy that. So I'll see if I can do that. I had a couple of other guest guitarists that deserve recognition for their creative contributions to this record. So let's find out about them. We've got Fai Janzek doing a very cool solo over here on track number seven, known as Escape to Alpha Ecliptus 2, Commander Johnny Thrust joins the fight. And here's what his solo sounded like. Okay, next line. Load the eternity tubes and prepare to fire! Okay, so we know which part we're talking about. Here is his guitar track soloed. Important to point out, uh, I believe this is a Dave Elich solo underneath this. So he intentionally went through here and wrote his guitar solo to match the Dave Elich improvisation. So there are some interesting fills when he does with, when he does those uh, slides going up. It's following the Dave Elich drum fills. Listen to this.
So at the end there, all I did was uh, make a cut and I dropped his level down because Keneally was coming in here. And they were both kind of playing at the same time. I'll show you what those two together sound like. Phi kept his going there for a while. Now also on guitar, we've got a Jake Wilson solo. Jake is another guitar friend of mine that I actually took a lesson from recently. Uh, let's see here. Let's bring up Jake's solo. Looks like I got a stereo track from Jake. And let's hear which section this is. Contains the torch of Astrid. And I think that's Dave Elich again on the drums. Looks like I put a little bit of delay on Jake's guitar. Just a basic delay plug-in. Uh, looks like a stereo delay. And... Super, super tasty player. What's going on there, Jake? What are you doing? Playing very lightly. It's very nice. You can hear all the little finger sounds. slide out at the end there. What, what's that happening? I'm scratching the frets. Oh, very nice. I like those little scratchy details. Here is by far my favorite sound in the Fractal Axe FX. It's called Cytherians. And it reminds me of Passion Warfare by Steve Vai and some Devin Townsend, like Infinity. It basically sounds like Aliens. So check this out. This is just a guitar plugged in using that Cytherians preset. Pretty cool. And that right there is like... If I had only that, Fractal would still be worth it to me. So let's move on over to some bulb rhythm tones, which are the most popular sound downloaded from the Fractal website. And I'm using this for the majority of the heavy rhythm guitars. It's like a rectifier type thing. Yeah, it's your basic rectifier chugga chugga chugga. So here's another one. This one is called Planets. And it's just another one of those cool textures that Fractal did a really good job on.
I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. All right, so there's also this lead sound, which is also a Misha Mansour thing. So I've used this for some guitar harmonies, things like that. It's basically the bulb sound with some delay and I think maybe some reverb on it. But uh, listen to what this sounds like. Yeah, listen to that. Uh, there's also this... Nolly 5150. This is another one of these. I think it's a preset that comes with the fractal, or did I download it? I don't remember. But here's a, here's another uh, sound that I'm using on the record. Here is one that I used my PRS SE on and I used the a JC120 Jazz Chorus Roland emulator which is like a uh, you know clean tone so here's a four part harmony that I recorded on one section <laughs> That's that for that. Very short little moments here that I'm using on this record. Everything kind of jumps around all over the place. And here is a emulation of a Vox AC30 that it looks like I did four parts on here. Let's see what this sounds like. Now here is a tone I used. I think it's basically the same bulb lead sound, but I added a diatonic harmony pitch shifter to it so that it's in a Lydian mode. So here's a little weird random guitar solo I played with that tone. Here's one that's called Corbamite, which I think is named after a Star Trek episode. And it's uh, one of those neat little effects you can get. A little texture in the background for a moment. I like jumping to those sorts of things. So let's hear that. And that was it. Just went over there to for two measures and just played that thing. Here's one called Happy Place, which is right underneath it. I don't know what that's going to sound like, but let's see what I did there. Now, here is a really cool tone called Frog Tone Lead, which I love sounds like this as a main melody. Sounds quirky and weird. Sounds like a little cartoon voice. So let's hear what I did on that. Here's another one called Funky Synth, which is using the synth emulator. It's kind of neat. Yeah, you hear that little glissando at the end. That's actually played on a guitar. Here's one called Buttery Lead that I used at some point. Let's see what this sounds like. Here's actually, it looks like some other guitars come in there, so let's hear all three of them at the same time using this buttery sound. Here's another little bulb rhythm moment. We'll see what this sounds like.
This is a remake of my 1996 prog rock composition, A Brief History of Broccoli, which I originally recorded with Pat McDonald on electric D drums in a garage. It appears on two different previous albums. I actually reworked it for the purpose of giving Virgil Donati something to do, and it was convenient that there was a solo section that Dweezil Zappa could play over. Virgil referred to this song as a bit of a mindfuck, which is the highest compliment coming from him. Here's a video of Virgil rehearsing the parts in his studio. It's an alternate take from the one that appears on the record. By the way, this track was sponsored through Kickstarter by Janet Boyd Rosencrantz and the Three Tards. Artyom Manukian and Paul Cartwright also appear on this track playing violin, viola, and cello. It's fun to think that this was the first complex piece of music I wrote back in college when I was 21, and now I have a rendition of it with some of my favorite musicians. Here's a video clip from 1999 Sir Millard Mulch Band at Light Painter in Sarasota, Florida.
Snickerdoodle. A brief history of broccoli. Carl sent me some piano and bass tracks that just gave the basic structure of the song. It was a little bit daunting at first. It was something that I was pretty sure that I could, I could do. There was, there was a lot to absorb and a lot, of, uh, a lot of changes to wrap my head around and to try and figure out how the drums would flow rather than just being a bunch of pieces put together. So I had, to, I had to do a lot of studying of just the individual parts. Carl also gave me a, a, a program drum outline so that I could get a little more of an idea of, of you know, the direction that he was thinking for the track. That was really helpful, but I still had to figure out you know, how, to, how to make it flow, how to, how to navigate those parts without making it sound awkward. So that was a real a real challenge for me, but it was it was very fulfilling to 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 make progress on and ultimately you know finishing the track and learning it well enough to where I could play the whole thing in one pass was was very gratifying. With all the dynamics that are going in, in this uh, in this track, it, it was really important to me to, to to learn it as phrases and paragraphs and and make it more um, like almost like a story because really the track to me sounds kind of like a uh, you know it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. There's so many ups and downs and it really tells a story even without having any lyrics or words at all. It's pretty exhilarating to be on a project that has so many accomplished players. I mean, we're really talking about the world's greatest players, in, in my opinion, as far as drumming goes. And these are, these are guys that, uh, that I've looked up to for years, um, and, and I'd never even imagined that there would be a point where I would be on the same uh, project or even in the same room, so to speak. And that, that's, that's just really a, a real kick, just a, a real boost to, uh, to my confidence level and, and uh, that's, that's a very exciting thing for me. It's just, it's wild. If I could go back in time and tell my 13-year-old self that I'd be doing this, um, I, I don't know that my 13-year-old self would believe it. How did JoJo feel about being voted off the show? Let me tell you. I recognize that while I may be the most evil of all in clearly unfathomable dimensions, I may not be the one who can be perceived as most evil in the network galaxy's censorship with an S. But the censors with an S do not understand, or at least what 87% of them do not understand, is that evil is an art. Of course, I could have let that asteroid obliterate the planet in a firestorm. Billions of people, that's a lot of zeros. But I did my research, unlike my fellow villainous archetypes, 
I knew the planet was already spewing a constant low-level compound that would eventually build up to the point where the inhabitants' bones turned to jelly. That is evil. That is art. If anyone could have transformed the asteroid into a plague that did that, they would have. I was just the only one that knew I did not have to. It is your negative vote which has placed me, and ultimately the universe, in this predicament. For it is you, my fans, who I adore and wish to destroy. This bitter potion will be a catalyzing beverage, a cocktail of force, an energy drink. It will fuel my strong nuclear force of hatred to greater and lower heights. No great evil was accomplished that was not attempted to be foiled. I'm working on the grammar, but you can quote me on that. Yes, today, the date that is marked by this universal time coordinate will be considered not the day semi-baron Jojo Holstein was voted off the timeline's most evil, but the beginning of the eschaton, a word which means the end of history. You can look it up. It's real. This is a piece of music about the election of Donald Trump. The melody is based on the words, all is lost. There are brief moments of hope when we think it's over for him. He's finally said something that will ruin his chances, or the vote will be recounted, or he's going to be impeached. Maybe the P-tape will get released. Maybe the aliens will come and save us. But no, each time he comes back stronger, with his ignorant march towards victory. It all ends on a final sad note. An up-and-coming Chapman stick player named Josh Goldberg played on this. I wanted it to be a simple duet, but after Josh recorded his parts, I decided to layer it with a Twilight Zone-esque wind section and percussion. At the end of the process, a bassoonerist named Monty Namadio came in and tracked the bassoon parts. He really jazzed up the articulation and brought it to life. So let's take a look at Cubase. Here we are. This was intended to be a duet. I've got some real bassoon on here. I love the bassoon. It's probably my favorite orchestral instrument. Love hearing it. Maybe even contrabassoon I like better. Not sure. I have a little bit of fake contrabassoon in the beginning. But anyway, let's have a look at some of the Josh Goldberg stick. Those are the low notes. I gave it a more dark sound. Up here he plays higher and starts going counterpoint. If we only had bassoon and stick, this is what it would have sounded like. But 
But I gave it much more of a Twilight Zone, Star Trek kind of Bernard Herman. violin is this is kind of nice it does a little tremolo here I like little touches like that let's hear this what have we got up here maybe some pizzicato or something oh some staccato violins. Oh, and there was some harp back here that's pretty good. A little bit of brass happening up here. For certain moments. And we got some Tam Tam. Adding a little mystique. Something I always have to use, which is the tubular bells. Oh, and there's vibraphone up here. Of course, down here, there's looks like three different string tracks doing different things. Let's hear what the cello is doing and the contrabass. Well, it looks like I used a thunder sheet up here, which I... I haven't really ever used on anything before. Let's hear that. That's basically it. Of course, there's a little bit of clarinet up here. Also, I forgot to mention, I doubled the stick track. I added in a 
just copied this onto another track and added distortion. And I can't tell. Let's see. That was some sort of amplitude setting. But the track is frozen right now. Just added a little bit more grit to it. So that's that track. This is a bonus track sponsored through Kickstarter by Alan Skeens and his Dachshund. Let's take a look at this one. This is a larger orchestral template. It's got the strings, percussion, bunch of brass, winds, Piano, as always, at the top. I composed it all on piano first. And then I put all, move all of those notes one by one or section by section into various orchestral instruments. This is a basic, I used kind of a comedy composition template. It's got the tritones in the beginning, so it sounds kind of wacky. And it's sort of playing a Lydian thing. Towards the end, it gets bigger. We could try listening to just the brass by soloing these. And let's see what we've got here. a look at what the strings are doing over here. Got some, you can see some action happening down here. There's also some stuff happening with the harp here. It's like some glissandos. Let's see what those are. Oh. Oh, just a little arpeggio. Yeah, you got one of those. And this also has probably way too many timpanis in it because each timpani note that you compose requires a different timpani, unless they're spread out and the timpani player will have time to retune. Oh, that's a flam. That's probably not supposed to be happening there. It's probably, there's probably a, a uh, there we go. So if I cut ahead to here, it probably won't be those flams anymore. There's a little key switch that happens 
in here. The C0, you have to write in one of these ghost notes that don't you don't hear. But then it tells you it to play single notes or flams or rolls, crescendos. Uh, let's see what else have we got here. Some cymbal rolls, which I use constantly when I'm doing orchestral stuff. Got some celesta back here. Looks like it's doubled with glockenspiel. And there's some bassoon happening up here at the same time. Over here, I see some more harp action. I'm curious what this is. It's probably should go along with these winds right here, using the Albion winds. Let's hear what that is. There's one moment in here that reminds me of John Williams that I probably stole a short phrase from. that is in it's something from Star Wars. So there you go. There is Odyssey of the Hungry Hungry Hound. It looks like I've got my reverb channels muted for some reason. Probably would have been a good idea to not have those. So now you can hear all the reverb. There you go. So there's that. Hope you enjoy that. The Mirrors of Tuzun Thun, a nine minute tribute to Conan the Barbarian. The name is taken from the Robert E. Howard short story about Cull of Atlantis, or Cull the Conqueror, the precursor to the Conan the Barbarian character. The story was written way back in 1929 and is super creepy. I was going for a darker piece, but by the end I was disappointed with this one. It's the final track I composed for the album. And somehow this reminds me of an Italian wedding or maybe a circus instead of a medieval barbarian. The simple musical motif in this was based on the number three. The brass melody you'll hear in the opening is made up of three different ways to change the rhythm of three notes. The time signature is in 3-4, and of course, those low drum hits are in groups of three. Here it is, the Mirrors of Tuzun Thun. As you can see, I have a tempo track up here. And this is a piece of music that's about, it's over nine, it's around nine and a half minutes long. And the tempo is all over the place, which you'll also notice basically every track on this album the tempo is all over the place I just keep ramping it up and down there's rarely a spot like this might be a flat line but for the rest of the time you've got it moving up and down everywhere this whole thing starts out with some brass being played by two trombones in the beginning. Two solo trombones, basically. Two players. 
And then the trumpets come in. Here there's these groups of percussive notes. Where are those at? Probably in this, see them here. There's that theme of three again. This piece also has one of those vibraphone sections, one of those spooky Twilight Zone moments, like right here. And the harp comes in. Got some winds up there, some bassoon. And it's building up and building up. some stuttering here, but uh, you get the idea. What else have we got? It's kind of a big template. This is the orchestral template I was using for a while. The new one I have is much bigger. Three again. Ends on a quiet little minor chord. Let's see what happens if I double click all of these and open them up. Here you can see the entire thing, all of the instruments at once on this crazy piano roll. There's the whole piece. This mess over here. There's another little tutti. Once again, there's that three voice thing happening, bass voice, the counter melody here, it's being, sounds like it's being played by either French horns or very high trombone, and then the main melody up here. This is a good exercise in trying to write a longer piece of music that was just one solid piece. I was aiming for 10 minutes, and by the time I did all my tempo adjustments, uh, 
during the final orchestration ended up being a little bit shorter than that, nine minutes and 20 seconds, something like that. It was a fun exercise and it's a pretty standard orchestral template. Very mainstream stuff here, nothing challenging or unusual. You've got the strings down at the bottom. I always mark those in green. My string tracks go up to here, which I didn't use any of the other libraries. I just basically used east-west stuff. And then we got percussion up here. Big group of percussion yellow tracks. Orange is brass. Blue woodwinds. And some purple up here I reserve for various sound effects that are group sounds. And then piano is always at the top. So pretty typical orchestral stuff. For the dialogue tracks, I was going for a Queen Flash Gordon soundtrack thing. A rock album with clips from a supposed sci-fi fantasy movie. I even used an EQ matching plugin and added hiss and foley to try to get the vocal clips to match the Flash Gordon movie dialogue. And at first the effect was too extreme and didn't blend, so I backed it off. One of the character actors was Mark Borchart. He was the subject of my all-time favorite documentary, American Movie. I got a chance to hang out with and interview Mark for my podcast a few years ago, so he agreed to do some voiceovers when I was making this record. In fact, when I first contacted him, he wanted to record the parts as soon as possible, the next day. His Cheap Moves put together a monologue for a character named Semi-Baron Jojo Holstein, or is it Semi-Baron Jojo Holstein? A supposed reality TV star from the future announcing his departure from the network galaxy's most evil of all. At first, I had it as its own track, with an abstract synth soundtrack and Mike Stone providing avant-garde percussion, but decided to split up Mark's dialogue throughout the record. In the final months of working on the album, I started to get bored with it after hearing it so many times. I was mentally checking out and wanted it to just be done, and I started to really doubt myself. Creative collaboration brought it back to life for me. I have my usual group of old friends to thank. His Cheap Moves, Level Nivolo, and Mr. Chubode. For the past 15 years or more, I've asked them to contribute their crazy ideas to my projects. A lot of times I will build a container, and I can always count on them to make up some random chaos to put in it. For instance, they wrote a lot of the fake commercials on the How to Sell album. By the way, Fai Janzek actually improvised his lines too, and was the first narration I recorded. I honestly didn't know until after the album was finished who wrote which bits of dialogue. I had to go back through a shared Google Doc and check the version history. So here are some examples of dialogue bits and who wrote them. Yes, today, the date that is marked by this universal time coordinate will be considered not the day semi-baron Jojo Holstein was voted off the timeline's most evil, but the beginning of the eschaton, a word which means the end of history. You can look it up. It's real. Nobody's exploding anything in my first act. I'm no space gravy drinker. Now I can see why they call it space cheese. We are surrounded by a trillion jactillion cubic parsecs of vacuum, yet no one can run the sweeper. Like it says on the schedule! Don't tell me you missed the planet. Again. Captain, our spaceship has been destroyed for the third time. Again. I had the coordinates, but I couldn't just write them on a napkin. What if I lost the napkin? What if a drone was watching? So I thought of a good coding scheme and I used it to write them down. I wish I could remember that coding scheme. Little do you know, Little do you know, Captain, 
that I have the secret. And with this secret, I can build a giant cyborg chicken. Not just any cyborg chicken, but an atomic cyborg chicken with the most deadly disintegrator lasers. Beware! This planet used to be alive. Millions of Rohini. Until Ikek burned it to the ground. The Cyborg Chicken is coming to your planet soon and will cause untold destruction and mayhem to your people. Apparently, every fueling station is filthy with you at the helm. It looked like a chair to me. It looked like a chair to you or you would have stopped me from sitting. Now we have to replace Vice Regent Esperanto's pet, and it's both our fault. Ikek, you vile, murderous maniac. I'll see you to justice before the Earth Space League. The ship is too heavily damaged. We'll never be able to crest the rings of Xenu Prime. Commander Johnny Thrust, reporting for duty. Those tentacles is disgusting. Just get it one last time. Relax, Thrust. Load the eternity tubes and prepare to fire. Wear that spacesuit with pride, soldier. When we get up into the inky black nostril of Zorbon, it'll be the only thing protecting you from spontaneous incineration. Why are you saying action? This is a documentary. You idiot! Try it again. At last, there it is. The Anti-Prism. I have searched the galaxy for... Oh. Oh, wait. That's not it. Never mind. This... We're under attack! Go to Red Alert! At some point... If you feel like it... Jim never has a second bowl of carbonized Argonian Black Death stew at home. Are there foodies in space, Captain? No. And there never will be. We're finally free! After I had already exhausted the recording budget, I decided to go all out and hire a real string trio. I knew Paul Cartwright from 10 years ago when I first moved to LA. We'd get together in a little Indian restaurant and eat samosas. It turned out that he was the violinist for Battlestar Galactica. I got him to play a bit of bitonal violin nonsense on my Dr. Zoltan album. For this album, Paul was actually able to play all of the viola parts as well, and we recorded most of his tracks at his home studio. Commander Johnny Thrust reporting for duty. I still am, and always will be, the world's biggest garbage donkey. Commander Johnny Thrust reporting for duty. I still am, and always will be, the world's biggest garbage donkey. I met Artyom when filming a Virgil Donati documentary a few years ago. When he came over to my studio to record, it was scary how fast he was able to sight read all of my cello parts and play them perfectly. Even without first hearing the parts, he'd just tell me to record and knock it out on the first take. Now, coming from a rock and metal background, I'm not used to that, but it's common for classical musicians. These guys added a level of nuance to the tracks that would have been difficult to get out of samples. Now, I obviously have nothing against samples, but it's generally much quicker to get an expressive part done if you can afford real players. Great players, that is. On track 9, Xenu Prime, Curse This Nebulous Nebula, Artyom played an improvised cello solo, sort of dueling with Mike Keneally. I added some distortion to the cello. 
Let's have a look at that section. All my fault. And then Keneally comes in there. I was written to the show to not understand humans. Okay. And then got some more RTM. interesting tone well now let's hear just so you know the difference let's hear what it sounds like without that distortion sounds more like a cello but there we go stuff. Sounds like a scratchy old harmonica or something. Dale Turner, composer, guitarist, guy with the thumbs. He collects and plays a lot of weird instruments, that guy. And the Sidrasi organ is just one of them. He jammed on this rare exotic electronic device on track seven, Escape to Alpha Ecliptus 2, Commander Johnny Thrust joins the fight. You can hear it at approximately 1 minute and 30 seconds in. Take a trip to Dale's home studio to find out what this demonic thing is. All right, this is the Sidrasi organ. This crazy instrument, I believe, was created in 2008 by Peter Blosser, distributed through Kiat Lombard. This is the second run of those instruments. The first run had aluminum bars. These ones obviously have wood bars. There's seven of these, and each one you depress to get a certain tone out of it. First, I'll demonstrate just its raw sound, and then later we'll talk about the role that these nodules have up here. These are tuning buttons. This is a master tuning knob and some other stuff we'll talk about. I guess the more experienced somebody is musically, the harder sometimes it is to accidentally come up with stuff. Stuff like this, you have no choice <laughs> because every time you turn it on, the notes are different. If you let it sit for a while, the pitches gradually drift. So it's pretty much a 100% random accident machine. Basically means you have to record everything and then hack it together and then celebrate. I'm going to turn it on. You're going to hear the fun opening explosion. Okay, the crazy thing about this is once you power it up, all these notes, like I mentioned, are going to be a different than they were previously. I'll just quickly do a tune-up of some of these so you can get an idea how to mess with this. Touch this wood tone bar. It's already got a note. A magical thing about this instrument is because it has two outputs, you touch the tone bar one time and keep your finger on it. It goes to one output. The moment you release it, a similar tone comes out the other side, like this. So we already got the first three notes of a minor scale, coincidentally. I'll just do a thing with that right now. Maybe since these two are a half step apart, I'll try to work out a little rubbing between the two.
So this knob I just messed with, of course, is referred to as a master pitch knob. It's what allows you global control over all the pitches, whatever you get going. Obviously, it got really high there, and just touching it stimulates some response. So that was its raw tone. Now I'm going to explore a little bit what happens when you involve these nodes up here. There's 42 of these and seven bars. Apparently, Peter designed these so that each bar has six random nodes. Some of them are linear, polar modulations some square wave tweakery, but you don't have any idea at all which nodes relate to any particular bar because it is designed to be a random accident machine. So I'm gonna randomly apply some of these alligator clips. So of course, again, given the randomness of the design intentionally, I really have no idea which one of these are dialed in with which tone bar. I actually happen to like this thing just for its pure tone and little chord sounds and pulsations you can yank out of it. But a lot of other people that own these really like it for its pretty amazing noise sculpting abilities. And a lot of that involves this knob, which is called the chaos knob. Once I twist that and start randomly touching stuff, it's gonna be a lot more explosive than the previous tones you heard. Alright, so there's the Sadrasi organ, a little moment we shared conjuring up some goodness. To me, one of the kings of random synthesizers. Always good to have something like this on hand if you're kind of used to, you know, if you're a little bit in the mad science music theory universe, it can be a healthy thing to have something that, no matter what, uh, is just random to add to your arsenal of sonic toys. Lance Myers. Claim to mainstream fame? Lead animator on that Philip K. Dick movie, A Scanner Darkly, starring Keanu Reeves, Winona Ryder, Woody Harrelson, Robert Downey Jr., etc. I've been working with Lance since 2009 when I hired him to design characters for an animated TV show concept called The Mysterious Octopus. To this day, I've never met him in person, never even talked to him on the phone. But since then, he's done two album covers for me, an ebook cover for my sci fi short story Cuyahoga, the cover art for Morgan Ogren's Conundrum, some shirt designs, my latest animated show project, Oracle of Outer Space, and probably more stuff I can't remember. I found him through this insane short animation he made called Skip and Lester. Lance gave me permission to include it here, so I hope you enjoy it and check out more of his work. Uh, how can I help you? Uh, can you tell me where the bathroom is? Uh, yes, I'm a bathroom. What? Yeah, uh, how, how can I help you? I, I'm a bathroom. I mean, I'm not certified yet, but tomorrow's a test, and yeah. Here's hoping. All right, what, who's, who are you? Yes, I'm a public bathroom. One or two. I'm a bathroom. I originally experimented with hiring an outside mixer, but decided to mix this whole thing myself. The 45 minute piece ended up having over 300 channels of instruments, so hiring someone else to understand what the hell I was doing would be a nightmare. Since I recorded the entire 46 minutes in one long Cubase project, once I mixed the first song, as long as I kept the levels of the main instruments, like guitar, bass, and drums consistent, the rest was done. That means I didn't need to start from scratch on every single song and then try to match them up later. It was just a matter of mixing all of those overdubs. This is the mixing board here, the Cubase. And as you can see, it's about 340 channels wide, which might be a lot for a rock album, but not so much when you start looking at uh, Hans Zimmer mixing templates and all that crazy stuff. 
the thing I want to point out here is that the majority of my mixing is not a lot of plugins and sometimes just an EQ booster or cut. There's not really a ton of plugins happening up here. Sometimes uh, I'll often use like a simple, very simple compressor on the default setting. But for the most part, if you look at all these channels, hardly anything going on. We've got a low cut on this cymbal roll. We've got a low cut on this death piano. But if you scroll across here, start getting into the winds, simple compressors, a little bit of Melodyne, no EQ. Hardly any EQ on all of these tracks. Although up here we do have some EQing happening. These are uh, Marco's drums. Over here, more drastic EQ on those drum tracks. But look at this, we move across here. Who's this? Travis Orban? Flat EQ. Uh, there might be some EQs going on up in here. Uh, we do have a little bit of EQing, like some low cut. Not very much happening up here. Some more low cuts. So I'm not a huge... And I don't, and I barely use reverb on anything. I'm also a very dry mixer. If you come across here, you mostly notice that just the levels change quite a bit. And I'm a big believer in just putting sounds where they belong and where they fit and where they fit in an arrangement rather than doing massive EQ curves. Say, so look at this, the Keneally guitars. There's almost no, there's nothing happening on these. They're almost, these are all just uh, duplicate tracks. So we could do take one, take two, take three, take four, and we'd create a new track each time. But very little happening. On this channel, I threw a transformer on it and a low cut. And cutting into all my guitars, all my fractal stuff on the main guitars, a uh, little bit of a high boost, and a big low cut. And that's on the buttery tone. So let's see, the JC120 sound, a little bit of compressor, nothing else. Uh, leads. We've got some leads, low cuts. All these guitars right here, nothing going on except for volume. Now when we get to the dialogue, they were drastically cut, uh, tweaked for effect. But that was for going for a specific thing to try to make it not sound like it was recorded with a close microphone. Um, so cutting through across all these, we got a synth synthesizers, barely anything going on here. Compressors, very basic compressor settings. All I do is the default compressor setting usually and maybe drop this uh, threshold a little bit. Levels. EQs flat, nothing going on. So in general, I don't add effects or EQ unless I really need to, if, unless I can't make the instrument sound right. And I, I basically won't add a sound unless I think it sounds right already. So it's really a matter of just arrangement. That's really the majority of my mixing that goes on. And here we are for the second portion of the most important art film of the century. We're now going to see Travis Orban playing Hero Ship, or Minimum of One Planet Must Explode in First Act in its entirety, with some other bits added in when available. Attention crewmates, Hero's Ship, or Minimum of One Planet Must Explode in First Act. But what does that mean? 
prepare the plutonium octopus, Darius. Initiate self-destruct sequence. being voted off the show, let me tell you. Stop those rebels! Those tentacles is disgusting. We've only self-destructed the ship seven times, and it's already the opening credits. Lower him into the chamber. But lower him slowly. I'd like to see the terror on his face as he sees the mutants we created earlier. He'll be hungry for his flesh. We've got company! Hey, should this say we've got a company? It is easy to forget these details out here between the stars. Damn these chronometric gastropods! Always trouble! Nobody's exploding anything in my first act. I'm no space gravy drinker. Cut. A company, you idiot! Who is directing this operation? that say you're wrong. Cut! It's not a company, you idiot. Man, this galaxy has really gone downhill. Chronometric gastropods! Useless, useless, useless! Count the appendages and tell me what you come up with!
I recognize that while I may be the most evil of all in clearly unfathomable dimensions, I may not be the one who can be perceived as most evil in the network galaxy's censorship with an S. What an unexpected technicity! do not understand, or at least what 87% of them do not understand, is that evil is an art. Don't worry, there will be a war Virgo at the next wormhole. Flavored space brain still can't fathom how you pulled off such a maneuver at level 9 Hyper War. See what they call it, space cheese. So we meet again, Doctor Zoltan. Do you want to mess this whole thing up with exposition? They're gaining on us. I could have let that asteroid obliterate the planet in a firestorm. Commander, there appears to be a time slug in our path. Damn these chronometric gastropods! I don't understand the science of it. Unknown Admiral, I'll go stare at my purple light and let you know in exactly 11 minutes. Billions of people, that's a lot of zeros. Don't send a robot to do a cyborg's job! We are surrounded by a trillion jactillion cubic parsecs of vacuum, yet no one can run the sweeper. Like it says on the schedule! What an unexpected tecronicity! I know, I know. It's your first time, but we, that is, you and I... Damn it! cannot clear his throat in anti-gravity. Don't tell me you missed the planet. Again. Now I can see why they call it space cheese. I often pause for a cup of tea next to the great blue nebula. And I, as I they're sipping on my Darjeeling.
mine one day. One day very soon. But I did my research. Unlike my fellow villainous archetypes, I knew the planet was already spewing a constant low-level compound. the inhabitants' bones turn to jelly. asteroid into a plague that did that, they would have. I was just the only one that knew I did not have to. This fueling station is filthy. Their fueling station is filthy. One more. This fueling station is filthy. It is your negative vote which has placed me and ultimately the universe in this predicament. Captain, our spaceship has been destroyed for the third time. Again. I had the coordinates, but I couldn't just write them on a napkin. What if I lost the napkin? What if a drone was watching? So I thought of a good coding scheme, and I used it to write them down. I wish I could remember that coding scheme. The next dance move is easier if you have a third arm or free tentacle, but you can get away with it if you have a flexible torso. Okay, one more. Give us that line again, but with more, you know, energy. Little do you know, little do you know, Captain, that I have the secret. And with 
this secret, I can build a giant cyborg chicken. Not just any cyborg chicken, but an atomic cyborg chicken with the most deadly disintegrator lasers. Close one. No, it wasn't. We're missing an engine. The cyborg chicken is coming to your planet soon and will cause untold destruction and mayhem to your people. my fans who I adore and wish to destroy. So, you mean Baron Chodrios knew about the pupating stage all along? <sighs> wicked man. Wicked, wicked man. I would high-five him if he still had arms. Sensors indicate an object in orbit around the planetoid. This bitter potion will be a catalyzing beverage, a cocktail of force, an energy drink. Exactly how many universes logical inexplicable artifact from an extinct civilization can there be? No more than one, I say. And this is the fifth one. How did that get 7.12 light years from Fluxtron? Apparently, every fueling station is filthy with you at the helm. Close one. That was a close one. That was a close one. Now that we have met the extra head, can you tell us if there are other surprises in store? Perfectly specific, yet perfectly useless. Oh, oh, my, that was great. That was fantastic. That was terrible. Let's do it again. How many stars? Seven? We're picking up a distress signal. It seems to be a snare drum, sir. My god, it's in 4-4. I told you not to bring that thing aboard. Now you're going to have to clean up all the filaments. It 
it will fuel my strong nuclear force of hatred to greater and lower heights. Anyone supposed to remember a movie title if it's longer than a single phoneme? This is a delicate piece of machinery. You can't just beat it with a quark wrench. You have to curse too. The planet is slightly better than a feces encrusted rock, but it has a fantastic polka scene. like a chair to me. It looked like a chair to you or you would have stopped me from sitting. Now we have to replace Vice Regent Esperanto's pet and it's both our fault. Why is all this classical music in outer space? Hey man, the producer says we need to shoehorn time travel into the plot so we can have the original actor cameos. Dorgonians cannot resist a buy one get one deal. Something in their evolutionary history. It's a fascinating story, but I forget the details. Just double the price of everything. Oh. The ship is too heavily damaged. We'll never be able to crest the rings of Xenu Prime. that was not attempted to be foiled. Same thing, just go again. 
This is a documentary. Cut. Start right back here. The ship is too heavily damaged. We'll never be able to crest the rings of Xenu Prime. Take a look at this. No, I won't. Okay. You've got my attention, Commander. I hope this is important. Very, Minister. You must permit me to launch the Sparrow and engage Ikek before all is lost. You can quote me on that. Alpha Ecliptus 2, a marvel of modern mechanization. Load the eternity tubes and prepare to fire. Commander Johnny Thrust, reporting for duty. I still am, and always will be, the world's biggest garbage donkey. Zarian matadors for just a chance to kiss her. Okay, next line. Load the eternity tubes and prepare to fire!
crash landing. Let's just get it one last time. Relax, Thrust. Again, less gurgling this time. That was terrible. I'm an android or an alien, whichever. Who cares? Let's just get this one last time. Let's beam down to the planet's surface and ride a motorcycle. Something the audience can identify with. You are trying to save your life here, but not too seriously. Because you have a recent backup. I'd give a crate of Osarian Matadors for just a chance to kiss her. Tycho Generator! This planet used to be alive. Millions of Rohini. Until Ikek burned it to the ground. Maniac. I'll see you to justice before the Earth Space League. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, two, one. Zero, Time six, to soar the spaceway! spacesuit with pride, soldier. When we get up into the inky black nostril of Zorbon, it'll be the only thing protecting you from spontaneous incineration. Phone rings. Say last name. I'm on my way. Whisper it like Kiefer Sutherland.
need a one word movie title. One syllable if possible. Can you make it less than a consonant half a vowel? One more time. We need a one word movie title. One time, long ago, I was a young, brash sky boy like you. Then I got wise to the hypocrisy of the Pobrecito Nosotros Via Lacte. I've had my fill of subhuman grab ass for the day. Bring me my sleep sack. says we need to shoehorn time travel into the plot so we can have the original actor cameos. Never mind. Why are you saying action? This is a documentary. You idiot! Try it again. Those scientists have finally lost their marbles. And it's all my fault. <laughs> I was written into the show to not understand humans, okay?
It was at that moment that I realized cloning a garbage can in zero gravity might have been a mistake. Who flushes a perfectly good Bossendorfer out the airlock? My darling, these dark days we spent apart have convinced me to travel the light years necessary to see you again. Focus your tractor beam on the circus master's hands. Make him do something embarrassing. It's the only way to defeat him. What do you mean, training wheels? At last, there it is, the anti-prism. I have searched the galaxy for, oh. Oh, wait, that's not it, Never mind. This is a seventh regeneration time pod, traveling through anti-space at twice the speed of liquefied oxygen in a vacuum. Get your head out of your colostomy bag. Yes, today, the date that is marked by this universal time coordinate will be considered not the day semi-baron Jojo Holstein was voted off the timeline's most evil, but the beginning of the eschaton, a word which means the end of history. You can look it up. It's real. This nebulous nebula! We're under attack! Go to Red Alert! At some point, if you feel like it. Jim never has a second bowl of carbonized Argonian Black Death stew at home. Are there foodies in space, Captain? No, and there never will be. We're finally free! I hope you've enjoyed watching this making of documentary thing. I hope you don't uh, copy it and give it to idiots who will copy it. Um, be sure to uh, visit me on Patreon. All right, good enough.
Is that good enough? Yeah. Are you sure, Carl? Yeah. It's a weak ending, man.